All right, thanks for staying with us now. In the past two decades have witnessed an impressive rise in women's political representation around the world, with a global average in the share of women in national parliaments doubling during that time, and all regions making substantial progress um, towards the goal of 30% women's representation in decision-making. However, the lack of progress with the women's political representation in Nigeria is surprising uh, surprising, rather, com considering that the women's role in the country's social, economic, and cultural landscape appears to be increasing, and it is expected that the increasing role of women in the society will translate to greater inclusion of women in the political process. Um, the recently released ministerial list um, continues... Um, the ministerial list, rather continues to represent the underrepresentation as only seven women made the cut of the um, 28 nominees by the president, Bola Ahmed Tinubu. So today we're asking is, in respect to this representation in the ministerial list, what impact would it have on governance? Now, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 You can also tweet at us at Wayshow, Africa One with the hashtag Wayshow. Um, let me come to you, Diola, then I'll come back and bring in our guest. What do you think this impact will look like? Mm. Well, I mean, more a bridge between the disparities, you know, um, 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 with the gender in terms of more men in, in politics and all that. Um, again, um, an increase in, um, you know, women-centric issues, you know, Maybe um, a more a more deepened way of look of policy making, mm. you know, considering that you have a larger pool of talent to explore. Women make up over maybe half the population in Nigeria, so having a very few minority, you know, represented in the government is really. But in fact, that's um, I, I I was researching and I saw something interesting that um, no president. So apparently there is a there is a national um, agenda or a national um, a national action. I'm Are you sorry? talking of the national affirmative action? Yeah. Uh, that you know, that, exactly. And no president has met, ever met that. You know, it's always been 6 or 7, 20%, 30%. It's, and, so I'm asking, I mean, is President um, Tinubu, I mean, in light of his um, Paul is a manifesto, you know, that said he is going to make sure that at least thirty five percent. Well, he has not released the full list yet, Navi. Well, I mean, again, you have to understand that there is a whole lot of public opinion riding on this. Mm. This is a time when you have to really, really, you know, let people believe in the kind of government that you're trying to create. Mm. So. People are mostly always very interested in the first things that happen. Mm. After that, you've lost them. Yeah. So everybody is now is like, okay, well, I mean, seven. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know. Let so, me bring in our guest, Mufuliat Fijabi, is a gender and development specialist and is currently the CEO of Nigeria Women Trust Funds and director of Sustainable Gender Action Initiative, who has worked as a passionate woman. Um, Women's, or women's human rights activists over the two decades, right? Over the last two decades. She has experienced, she has experienced rather in communications, women's leadership and political participation, resource mobilization, policy development and advocacy, as well as inclusion of vulnerable groups, which are women, youth, and persons with disabilities in development and demo, um, the democratic processes. She has joined us um, via phone. This evening, thank you so much for joining us, Mufiliat. Thank you very much for having me. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Apologies for the network uh, glitch. <laughs> <laughs> Would have loved to see your face. All right, so quickly, I mean, we are like uh, racing for time here right now um, because when we start the conversation, it's, it just runs very quickly. Mm -hmm. But tell us um, when the ministerial list came out again. What was your uh, first observation, especially as regards to the representation of women on that list, you know, was it a good thing for you or was it something you say, oh, no, 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 I, I expected more? 
Okay, uh, for me to have even seen and heard that uh, women are on the list, I was quite happy and um, impressed. And then afterwards, I started looking out for the numbers. And uh, when I saw that it's just 7 out of 28, that's about 25%. Um, uh, that does not meet the minimum standard that the country has adopted, which is 35%. The adoption of 35% by Nigeria as a country is a minimum benchmark. And one would expect that the um, president in his appointment would meet up to that minimum benchmark. We want this particular government to actually um, beat all bookmakers, beat past governments, by ensuring that um, the appointment, because I understand that there are still many more to come, uh, that it reflects that minimum benchmark of 35%. If you look at um, the regional documents and some of the international commitments that Nigeria as a country has made, the benchmark for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women at the Beijing Platform is actually 30. But Nigeria chose to have 35, which is commendable. And this is also founded in the Nigeria's national gender policy. And also very um, remarkably well spoken by Federal High Court uh, in Abuja, the 35% has also become uh, something that a court of law, you know, has upheld for Nigerian women and for the government to implement. So we're not asking for 35% because uh, that's what we so much desire as women, but it's what Nigeria as a country desires. But the political will to make it happen should be uh, taken very seriously. Nigerian women should be compensated and commended uh, by ensuring that whatever list comes out, the total percentage must reflect a minimum of 35% affirmative action for women. Mm. It's not about the percentage, but about the need to be in tune with what is happening globally in terms of governance and inclusion. Mm. Um, a country is made up of both male and female, and as such, uh, the governance should be one that is inclusive, that encourages the participation of both men and women from an informed perspective. Okay. Thank you. All right. mm. Okay. Um, I just want to build on, on what you've just said about inclusion and even the 35%, right, where we're currently struggling, because I think National Assembly now, I think it's about 17% or mm. thereabouts. Um, but I want to ask about the factors. Of course, Generally, there are gender issues for women, right? Right across board, whether it's in corporate, um, that gender issue does exist. But when it comes to politics, I'd like to hear your thoughts around potential barriers for women. So we've heard stories around perhaps the violence in politics, different issues that may perhaps prevent women from wanting to go into politics. So I'd love to hear your thoughts around those barriers that prevent women today from playing in the political space. Okay, when you talk about to, about barriers to women's leadership, there are quite a number of them, and one that I always speak about um, is the one of culturally justified barriers to women's political leadership, uh, which means that we still live in a country that is fully, um, you know, not so receptive to women's leadership. So, and if you notice, since the return of Nigeria to democratic practice in 1999, there has been an increase in the interest of women to participate actively in the governance of Nigeria. So, but as we continue to record increase in women's political participation and uh, active involvement, you know, in uh, governance, 
the percentage and the level of women emerging as representatives, elected representatives, has unfortunately continued to drop. And we should have been able to have um, a strong Greek um, um, support in terms of having women appointed into uh, political positions, but that's not the case. So there's a contradiction between the level of women's participation and show of interest and the number that eventually emerges as elected representative and as appointees of governments who can play critical roles in governance. Mm. So this tells us that um, in spite of the interests of women, we need a complete reorientation around the importance of women's leadership, both from the religious and the cultural perspective. Women's participation in leadership should be a welcome development because um, without the two uh, wings, you know, the country cannot fly sufficiently well and cannot deliver uh, sufficiently well as well in its development efforts. Added to that factor is the one of um, the unlevel and unequal playing field. Most times, uh, political participation revolves around political parties. Uh, political parties today is still very much patriarchal. Uh, the support given to facilitate women's representation is still not very um, balanced. And um, it also goes with a lot of bureaucracy and um, godfatherism, as well as uh, political bottlenecks which men also experience, but not as much as women. And um, if you look at our trajectory political-wise, women's um, involvement in political parties have always been limited by um, the factor of patriarchy, which means um, the notion of male control. Mm. For as long as we continue to deal with patriarchy, and um, combined with the unequal playing field, it will continue to impact on women's emergence okay. as elected representatives. All right. And um, this calls for a lot of attention. Also okay. associated with that is the issue of finance, especially as resources required for mobilization in political participation. Oftentimes, uh, women don't have the necessary work with her in terms of resources to fast track their constituency building in terms of logistics and to enhance their ability to mobilize their constituency to understand their manifesto and understand their political ideals. Women are still very much far behind. And I must at this point also mention the role of the media the media derives a lot of pleasure in giving visibility to male uh, political candidates and less for female candidates. There are lots of factors that have been matched that have shown that while women are still very much behind in the way the media covers their efforts around political participation, the men have gone far ahead. So, but so there are so many more factors to absolutely. talk about, but I'll stop here for now. I was going to just say to you that regarding media, you know, women to have a huge, you know, they have a huge part to play in that because I know so many women that were running for political offices that we kept on sending invitations to come and talk. You know, it was difficult for you to get them on the show, but if you, if you send them an invite to a male, their male counterpart, I mean, he's already in the studio having that conversation. So you really can't really blame the media. But let's take a break, right? When we come back from that break, I believe Diola has a question. Then I have a follow-up question for you. Stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, if you just tuned in, we're discussing this women's representation, right, At the, especially with the ministerial list and the impact it will have on governance. Now, uh, we have with us Mufuliat Fijabi. Now, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. 
Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0818034663. You can also tweet at us at Weisho Africa one with the hashtag Weisho. All right, Dela, you have um, a question, right? Oh, yes. Um, I wanted to take us back to leadership, you know, women's leadership, but this time around um, leadership capacities of women. So um, I'm going to ask our guest, I mean, in your expert opinion, um, what do you think are the unique um, perspectives, you know, in terms of leadership that um, women can bring into governance and um, politics? What, what capacities, you know, do they have and how much, you know, can they take governance further in the scheme of things? Um, first and foremost, I'll, I'm going to say that women are naturally focused persons. Uh, they don't take things for granted. If they have a tax ahead of them, uh, their strength and ability to focus and achieve success is uncomparable. And if you talk about the, the strength in their expertise and experience, you cannot also bring that down because uh, women, especially Nigerian women, we have um, a lot of strength in the expertise that we build for ourselves. And that's why if you, you've seen um, several women, Nigerian women, performing excellently well in their chosen field, uh, both nationally and internationally. And of course, in terms of um, remaining consistent and resilient, women are resilient. Uh, in spite of challenges, they forge ahead to overcome challenges and to create new paths for success. And they are also natural managers, uh, people who have um, content, who have focus, and uh, who demonstrate natural management skills, which, of course, they always bring on board, you know, combined with their professional uh, career growth. So um, if you look at women, career women, women who show interest in politics, even in the informal sectors, um, women, you know, demonstrate a lot of um, skills. It's the communication skills, the listening skills, you know, the ability to mobilize, you know, and the ability um, to remain focused is um, not something one can push aside. So the non-emergence of women as elected representative is not because women are not qualified. Um, it's because of the landscape that we exist and um, thrive on, which, um, as earlier discussed, is on balance and uh, it's not equal, not sufficient enough and supportive enough to have women come out to attain these roles and contribute their own quota to the development of the country. So women remain good experts good and resourceful person who can make uh, change happen as the need arises. Hmm. Okay, um, Mufulia, so I want to ask a question around this 35%, um, uh, what do they call the word now? Affirmative, Affirmative action. action. Affirmative action. Yeah. Is this a token or it's actually supposed to be our right, you know, for us to take you know what? Because most times when I hear people talk about this 35%, it seems like it is beg beg. We have to go and beg them to make sure that they, they what's it called, um, they implement that 35%. So that's what I'm asking. I want to have some clarity. Is this a token or is something that is meant to be by law? It's supposed to happen. And if so, if it is the latter, right? What is supposed to be the actions that we are supposed to be taking right now when we don't see that, those representations with the political appointments or whatever it is that we're, we're seeking for in terms of leadership and governance? So, so can I just add to that as well? Because last year, remember the, the bills, the gender yeah. bills, there was one there that sought to increase the quota of seats to 20%, mm -hmm. not even 35%. And I don't believe that was passed. It so I just wanted to add that there, mm -hmm. maybe in the context of that, to yes. say, is it just a nice number? But is it, not with, is it, there's no direct is, intention yes. behind it. So let's know, let's know what we are fighting. <laughs> okay, actually, um, 
the fact that there is an affirmative action is a recognition of the fact that um, the, the, the process has not been balanced, there has been a gap, there is need to make some deliberate efforts to uh, close the gap that exists. And when you talk about affirmative action, where it's on the side of the women now, so that the gap in gender balance can be closed. Who knows, it may be the men who may be asking for affirmative action the next time. But the affirmative action as adopted by Nigeria, based on the National Gender Policy of 2006, is one that speaks to affirmative action for either men or women, you know, depending on um, whether it's men or women that are being affected. So, but in this case, as we speak today, um, the women are more affected. They are the ones that are not um, being included in the governance process. And that's why that policy speaks very strongly about the need to um, attain minimum of 35. 35 is a minimum, you know, to drive the process and to also ensure that the gender balance... So if we do not see this 35%... And at the same time... Go ahead. Um, most times... The, the the successive governments, you know, have not have never reached thirty five percent for women in appointive positions, mm. which which is what the policy stipulates, and that's why a group of organisations led by the Nigerian Women Trust Fund after the twenty nineteen election went to the court, and on the sixth of April twenty twenty two. Um, the Federal High Court, Abuja, delivered a very strong judgment compelling any government of the country of Nigeria to obey that minimum of 35% affirmative action. So actually, legally, if the government is not obeying that, it's a contempt of court. And of course, um, Nigerians, Nigerian women should actually uh, rise up to that occasion, you know, to seek for and demand for their rights. So the national gender policy is actually now being backed up by a court injunction, especially for appointive positions. Mm -hmm. This is different from elective positions. Mm -hmm. I was the one that, that you referenced at the National Assembly last year during the Ninth Assembly, yeah. uh, that one speaks to additional seats for women uh, in elective positions. But fortunately, that bill um, didn't sail through. Mm. We're hoping that the 10th Assembly would also take it up from there and do the needful. It, the interesting thing about that particular bill for additional seats is that uh, it was actually co-sponsored by both honorables, male and female, um, at the 9th Assembly. So it's not a case of only women mm seeking uh, for the passage of that bill. I was just going to say that, you know, if you look at the political scene, the people that vote more are women. So I'm not even going to disturb my head around the elective positions, right? Because those ones, we need to just really tell ourselves that if I see a woman on a ballot box uh, paper next time, I'll vote for a woman regardless, right? If we start to consciously make those decisions, maybe we'll see some switch when it comes to women in elected positions, right? But for this one, I'm glad you have said it, that it's actually something that we can take to court if it is not met. So, I mean, in, in moving forward, right, do we really need to consider competence? Because, again, when the issue around women um, 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 selections or whatever happens, people always throw around this story of, is she competent and all of that. But, I mean, you never hear them say that about men. So do we still need to play the card of competence when selecting those women? Or, you know, as long as it's a woman, it will suffice, in your opinion? Um, for, for me, um, a combination of quantity and quality is what works perfectly well. Mm. And what I mean by quality is that, of course, women have the expertise. The seven women that have made that list now, if you look at their background, they are very strong women who have demonstrated leadership and expertise in their various fields. And some of them are actually serving the government. So, so we, we argue with you that that is a political appointment because <laughs> it doesn't look like some of them... It, it, I mean, come on. <laughs> Mufuliat. 
Let's be real. <laughs> it seems like well, it seems like this is like political. They worked hard, so let us. Know. Whether, whether it is political <laughs> or not, you cannot say that those women do I'm not have qualified. competency. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you said, most times people speak about whether women are competent or not, but they don't speak of same for women. Mm. So you cannot say those women don't have reasonable level of competence to serve in those positions. True. Some of them actually qualify better than some of the men on that list as well. Mm. So, but most times they bring women's expertise down by saying that are they competent, uh, they are not competent, you know. So, competency is important, uh, but when we talk about competency and leadership, uh, the level of women's competency is not something to be thrown away because uh, they don't throw the same card to men to, to start querying their competency. You know, I, I would say, elect them, I mean, select them first. If they don't do it, don't worry. There are more women to replace them. <laughs> just be giving, giving exactly. them, the, giving them the position. You know, if they just want to not perform, women, you can even push back be, oh. because they have their own pedigree we as well. Oh. They are not women. You can push back mm -hmm. absolutely know, because they, they have um, the way with them. Yeah. They also demonstrate their competence. Absolutely, absolutely. Even if they don't demonstrate, just elect them first. Uti, okay. <laughs> go ahead. Um, okay, so we have a comment here from Daniel Illo. He says, good evening, my dear beautiful sisters of ways, women representation in the ministerial list and the impact on governance. I am a fan and supporter of women occupying offices in government because I believe they can bring a change that women fail to bring. Your guest made mention of women's participation in government, which is a welcome development that should not be ignored. I also believe in the saying that what a man can do, a woman can do better. Seven positions out of 28 is not bad, but could be better. I really thank God that women were considered for positions in office. It gives me so much joy. Finally, I believe that women can and will create an impact in government for the better, um, for the better without any shadow of a doubt. And he mm. says, welcome back to me. Thank you, Daniel. Much thank you, Daniel. I mean, so if you had one final comment to say, uh, Mufiliat, what would that be in a second? Well, we should run governance that is inclusive hmm. to have um, a very strong democratic process in our country, Nigeria. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, really lovely to have um, had you on the show today. We hope to have you physically very soon. Thank you, Uti. Thank, Thank you, Diola. Thank you. So In case they are looking for ministerial appointees, we have competent people here. Competent. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we don't lack competence. <laughs> if we say one is not good enough, <laughs> we have plenty of replacements. <laughs> Just shall be putting us on that list. <laughs> but please, President uh, Bola Metin, we are begging We're you. We want to see 35. Women. The yeah. list we want to see is 35 percent. So this new list that is coming out, let's have more women on that list, please. It's very important. We have tried. We can make a difference. We've tried men all these years. What did they do? But even if you look at the women that have gone past, they have made a difference. Of course. I mean, uh, Okunjo, I mean, the, oh, the, the list women. is endless. Yeah. Yeah. So just please give us, you know, it is where. Okay. Before we go, <laughs> make sure you follow us across all our social media handles. So that way, show Africa, you can interact with us further, drop a comment. More importantly, follow all our engagements online. Like, share, invite your families and friends to watch and follow the conversation. And if you missed our quote for today, let me fish that out. So it says, where's my quote? Women have always had, a, had to be creative about making limited resources work to sustain themselves and their families. They understand what it means to make the hard decisions and to just get on with it. That is why it is imperative for women not just to be the ones dusting off the table, but crafting its leg for our world to stand on. This is a very powerful, powerful quote. quote. Very powerful, powerful quote. We actually are builders. Imagine yeah. if we had more women since. Nigeria for don't change. Mm -hmm. What are the users where? Women are doing well. <laughs> we'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. As we bring another great conversation mm -hmm. to your screen. Ciao.